Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3 with Black Ice 9.11. And of course, we are playing as, yes, you got it, Japan. So let's continue this. We should maybe withdraw a few more of these forces. Uh, Pat concluded your Imperial Highness um, Canada has been accepted in, to the Allies. We shall watch these developments carefully. Um, so, oh, well, yes. It started. How interesting, how interesting, how interesting, how interesting it has started. So, the Germans have been able to push into French held Maginot line. How interesting. And of course, they're pushing into Poland as we would expect. The AI normally doesn't put enough forces into East Prussia. But we can watch this. Well, let's pause. I wanted to move a few of the forces, getting them out of these places. They're sending them here because there's a port. There's lots of infrastructure to, to handle supply. And, well, I don't know. we got to see about coming down through here. Or through here to here to here. That's our Burma Road. Okay, well, keeping that in mind. Well, keeping, yeah, that's going to be some of these forces that are out here. And some of these nice light infantry type forces should be good for that. So, okay, the fascist militia will be a little better at keeping things suppressed. The horse C units, I'm not sure what I want to do with those at the moment. Let's send them out here because they can do okay suppression and once there is an outbreak of um, bad dudes. Well, maybe we're the bad dudes, but well, you know what I mean. Um, they can ride in quickly. Let's move you to a port. I don't think we need to keep occupying this. Terrain. And I don't know how useful these guys would be in... Not that they wouldn't have use, but either trying to march through here, and we can look at here to see mountains, mountains, jungle, mountains, mountains. They're not going to be the greatest fighting force. These also probably have infrastructure too, but um, swinging down through here. We could build it here, but we may build that in time that would save us a couple provinces to have to move through and go directly there. Yeah, that's probably a good idea if we are going to need to be coming here. But then again, of course, we could... Yeah, I don't know. Um, you know, we'll see what we want to do versus the Indians. Um, getting into here, uh, the cavalry would be of some use, um, just as additional forces. But if it's all sort of out, stuck out around here you just move it to ports and you know once you're sort of getting into here i presume we'll have enough transports and enough sea control to be able to you know put it into here once we break it down to here but while we're contained in sort of this sort of zones of the world a little might be of help but not a whole lot of them would be of help i don't think okay um yeah it's a little better one of one one of them, of course. They've got armored cars. Okay. Getting some of these units moving will help out. That's even a better one. Of course, we do have the idea of a few more forces to face off against the Soviets.
Yeah. Okay, now let's go back and watch what's happening in Poland and France. I'm a little surprised that even the AI, at least when I've normally been playing. Now, fortifications are not, I if you remember from my last German series, I way reduced fortification levels for the final assaults on Moscow and such, primarily Moscow. But um, I then put it back up. So fortification levels have been left as they were standard in my last German playthrough, which is less than the standard B ice, black ice, but more than the standard um, level for um, their finest hour, you know, the standard game. So they're weaker than the black ice that I think overdoes it. They're not just, as I took them way down for dealing with Moscow, but, you know, so they're weaker than that, but they're stronger than regular. So it's just my estimation of somewhere between difficulty levels and realistic levels kind of thing. So, um, and you may have watched me grinding a little bit against these fronts and didn't have too much success, especially not this early. So I wonder what's over here and we're not in the access to see and we're, I don't think going to get in anytime soon. Okay, industrial efficiency has advanced, which I think we're going to yell at this go. And so that, again, this negative, I just want to sh show out. Oh, no. This is balanced off against that. So that would, um, you know, the other, like it's 15 or whatever, plus 15. So now it's only a plus 10 and vice versa. So that is a good thing to keep going, you know, more and more of it. Plus, it's also good to keep it balanced because of that. So that the, okay, who out here? Okay, Poland's about ready to stop being able to um, trade with me. Um, Bulgaria, do you have money? You have money. You want some supplies? We'll sell you some supplies. Okay, good. Australia. No, you're not happy enough with me. Argentina doesn't. Bhutan. Can we trade with Bhutan? Oh, Bhutan's a um, British puppet, so we can't trade with Bhutan. Uh, I think making a British puppet is going a little bit too far from my, what I know of Bhutanese history. Chile, they need lots of supplies. They got a little money. Apparently not enough money or something. Denmark, okay, maybe. No, Guatemala. Hungry or landlocked, so we can't. Um, they don't have enough money realistically. The Netherlands, okay, they got money and need it fairly badly, okay. So they've got 77 and need 44. So let's go with a pretty big chunk. While we can, I don't know when Germany's going to declare war on them. Um, Nicaragua. Would you want one? No. Poland, like I say, they're going to be cut off from being able to trade very soon. Technically, I think I could still trade into that port, but Soviet Union, we've been hurting our reputation with them, but we'll at least see. Now, maybe once they go to war with Germany, they'll want some desperately enough to do it. Sweden. Well, they don't like us enough. Turkey. 
Okay, well, let's see if we can sell them one or two. Oh, not enough money. Okay, well, let's also see about where's the US? US. It's just with this, I'm worried about. Oh, let's reduce it by one. Nice round number. Worried about an eventual embargo, but I don't know if that's going to happen or what would trigger it now that we are at peace with everybody and have no plans on going to war with anybody until the big push. Planning to do the land grab against um, Vichy France for into China, which might contribute to some bad outcomes diplomatically, but we'll get some more oil. Um, and some more high seas and stuff, so it would all be good. Of course, we're hurting for resources from our lack of a current trade bonus. Okay, to bet. We give them money for rare materials. Yes. Italy. Um, all right. Brazil. Okay. Um, no. How bad are we hurting for steel and coal? Um, no, too big of a chunk. We'll see what we can do for steel from the U.S. here in a moment. I know that's pushed down into the negatives again. Okay, gun turrets advanced. Very good. And... Okay, yeah, that is... Um, yeah, that would be probably a better option here. Large caliber machine guns, cannon. Japan did use a 20 millimeter gun on their fighters. I think they were mounting their big guns in the wings and their smaller guns to fire through the propellers. I don't remember exactly. Okay, that didn't last that long. Guess we might as well come back to here. Okay, they've connected up there. The Soviet Union's now moving against Poland as well. Belgium is now in the Allies. How interesting. So they're probably going to join the war very soon. Which could mean if Germany didn't occupy this at all. Bad things. Okay. We have lost the effects of medium popularity and gained the effects the effects of high popularity. Very good. Okay, the Kalkin Gol ceasefire. The Japanese commander Michitaro Komatsubara issued to or, or refused to accept the outcome of the battle. However and had prepared a counteroffensive. This was canceled when the ceasefire was signed in Moscow. Um, when Zhukov um, competed with the, uh, completed the annihilation of the 23rd Division, 
Great events were taking place thousands of kilometers away in the west. The very next day, on September 1st, Adolf Hitler launches his invasion of Poland, and World War II broke out in Europe. The Soviets had already agreed to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, which called for the Soviet Union to occupy eastern Poland and establish a sphere of influence in Finland, Latvia, and Estonia. That was all sort of secret as part of the thing. Um, there was other public parts. The Soviet and Japanese signed a ceasefire on September 15th. Took effect the following day. Okay, sign the ceasefire. Declare war. No, we're not going to declare full war. Um, that would be stupid. But I wanted to see how this was handled. Um, all right. So we will sign the ceasefire. And we have more leadership because we now have high popularity. Um, ah, these would be good options. There we go. Now they pushed into three provinces here, where before it had just been one. Normally I only see this bad of stuff going with the Hearts of Iron 4 AI. And oh, now if Paris is going to fall soon. Because if Germany can take these provinces without much problems, they probably have enough forces to hold them from a counterattack, because these are super high level bunkers. Not maybe 10, you know, fully completed levels, but they're, they're pretty damn high. Okay. Ooh, um... Okay, landing craft flotillas have advanced. Very good. Um, yeah, I think we will shift this to other thing. Machine gun position, which is more shore bombardment than that. Uh, landing craft defense, twin engines. Ooh, speed is nice. Range is even nicer. So we will do that first. I hope these are upgradable to stuff. Germany has lost the tirpitz. Hmm, wonder where that happened. Okay, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get the division and the mountain division. The river division and the mountain division. Okay, good. Um, we have a bunch of headquarters here now. I don't know when. We probably will be making more divisions, but right now we are focusing on infrastructure. We've got four carriers, three of them full-size carriers, only one of them is a CVL in production, and then lots of uh, infrastructure, well, buildings, I should say. Uh-oh, somebody got a bl blueprint. Hope it was a friendly power. Um, does it say down here? Sometimes I know it does. Uh, wing guns acquired by enemy spies, but it doesn't say who's. Okay. Um, fighter pilot training, very good. I know I've talked about this, I think, mostly in the Hearts of Iron 4 series, but um, I don't know how much I've talked about it um, in the this series, so I'm sorry. Cause <laughs> some, like, like I know I've talked about this um, that I've recently read, but... I don't know if it's going to be a repeat for you because I know a lot of you don't watch both series, you know, Hearts of Iron 3 and Hearts of Iron 4. And people come along later and whatnot too. But Japan had a really harsh, and this is what I mainly know, and I presume it's also the same for the Army Air Force. Again, the Army has an Air Force, the Navy has an Air Force. This is, you know, Britain has a Royal Air Force. The Royal, well, the Army, the Royal Army, whatever. Um, and then the Royal Navy. And Britain had just called the Army, really. So those are three independent services. In America, 
there is the Army and the Navy. And the Army Air Forces. Now, the Army Air Forces is more or less sort of an independent organization. It is nominally under the um, Army. It does not become the Air Force until after World War II. Hearts of Iron Four got it wrong when they put one of the Air Force generals into a blue uniform. And, you know, they, they got told. But they haven't changed that, and that is a post-war um, thing because there was no Air Force in World War II for the U.S. So the U.S. is sort of in this situation, but not quite. Um, the United States Navy operated, well, they did do a, you know, an anti-submarine, um, an anti-naval type patrol that had land-based aircraft. And I mean land-based is not amphibious. I mean pure land-based stuff. But it was pretty damn minor, and it was very targeted towards naval operations and um, often um, targeted towards anti-submarine type operations. Um, so it was a minor situation. In that, in that way. They also, of course, excuse me, operated carrier aircraft. They operated aircraft that came off of battleships and um, light and heavy cruisers. Even a few destroyers were capable of launching a float plane. Um, you know, so those are sort of reconnaissance aircraft. And they, they operated a bunch of amphibious type aircraft. The Coast Guard also, U.S. Coast Guard also operated a bunch of aircraft um, for Coast Guard um, operational duties along U.S. coast hunting, primarily submarines as well. So the Coast Guard had its own air, air arm as well. But other than um, carrier-borne operations to go after, you know, island invasion types, most all of the... Um, land bombing missions done by land based planes was the army air corps and it would work in coordination with um everybody else um there was a big controversy that um for the midway battle they had flown in about every single bomber from um, hawaii out to here the midway bombers went out and um bombed the japanese carriers the, these pilots got home and then the sort of totals of ships bombed got reported and so the air army air forces took credit for all those things they didn't hit a single japanese uh, ship they made them dance around a bit but not uh, unfortunately even dancing around while the navy was attacking so it was a i almost said useless it was an ineffective maybe meaning it may have had uses but it was in an ineffective bombing mission. Too high um, to drop their bombs uh, because the ships could like go, oh, there's aircraft coming. Oh, they're releasing their bombs. Well, let's not be here when the bombs show up. So they just move or, you know, near misses are, you know, not that effective with them. And the bombers were not really trained to hit moving targets. They were trained to hit stationary targets like, oh, there's the ship. Let's get the bomb site on. OK, we're over it. Release. But even as it's going, the ship is going, you know, 30 knots or something, you know, a good fast carrier. That's a little more than 30 miles an hour. Don't know what that is in your weird um, measurements the rest of the world over. But um, that's they still measure speeds at in the air and. Um, let's see in knots, but uh, and that's knots is nautical miles an hour. Nautical mile is different than a land mile. Yeah, I know it's confusing, but so they're going pretty quick. And so as the bomb is going to hit where the ship is now, the ship, even if it doesn't do anything, just as it keeps going as it is, is not going to be there. You've got to come in closer. I know I've talked about the difference between um, 
Italian and German air attacks in the Mediterranean and who got closer. So the army, particularly in the early days that Midway was, really sucked at hitting ships. They did get better. Some of the skip bombing that the Americans would do, come in low altitudes, drop bombs that would skip across the top of the water and um, then into the, the ship. Sort of like a torpedo, if you will, but, but faster than a torpedo. And so coming in really fast, you really didn't have to lead the target. Ships weren't enough. So you come in close, release them at a low altitude and peel away. Um, was skip bombing, and I believe that was mostly being done by the Army Air Force. I believe so. I'm not entirely sure. But skip bombing was a thing that they did. They got much better. But Japan, it's even more of a divide between the Army and the Navy within the air powers. Um, the Navy flew a lot of land-based missions against the various air powers fighting in China. And by that, I mean Chinese Air Force, so, um, Soviet piloted Air Force, you know, with Chinese markings, American piloted Air Force with Chinese markings, and then the Army Air Corps that Chenault takes over once the U.S. is in the war, which they keep some of the, you know, Flying Tiger type um uh, AVG type symbology, you know, the teeth on the aircraft and whatnot, but they are starting to have U.S. markings instead of Chinese markings on the aircraft. All these various things. The Navy was flying and including some fighter types that were not capable of being flown off of carriers were fighting in here. So the, the Navy's sort of doing its own thing. The Army's doing its own thing. Unlike the U.S., which a lot of aircraft, like all of the land-based bomber types that the Navy did use, were made in the same factories as the Army land-based bomber types. They just had minor modifications for like dropping torpedoes or whatever the Navy wanted to do slightly different than the Army, and sometimes it was no real difference at all. Um, but there, to the best of my knowledge, there, an Army aircraft factory only built Army types and a Navy aircraft factory only built Navy types. There was no, oh, you need some of this type? Well, just get them from this other factory. No, it was very, very much a divided um, system. Obviously, you have, you know, specialty carrier aircraft and things like that that are enough different that don't, jump back and forth between the services but there are a bunch of other types that do and within the u.s so i'm sort of emphasizing that it's even more than this okay what i know what i've read about is the navy's pilot system now at this time in 1939 1940 the navy has really high tough requirements for its pilots, even its non-fighter pilots. Really tough, they're really brutal. I mean, physically brutal. I mean, to the point of breaking bones on, you know, hitting them with sticks. And I don't mean um, switches or things. I mean like an inch thick diameter things that they're hitting their pilots with every day and by other higher grade classmen. And it's it's really brutal. They're really brutal on them. They send a lot of, lot of their high-level pilots to the hospital with um, injuries. And a lot of the pilots that are going through the school are flying with um, heavily bruised up bodies, bodies that are literally bleeding from the nights before beating. I, I, I can hardly overstate the level of brutality that I've read from some of the pilot schools. And so they wash out a large percentage, I don't want to give the percentage, but maybe even over half of the number of pilots that um, qualify for the basic level of entry to get into the pilot schools. They wash them out and send them to doing other things. I don't know what they do. I believe this is similarly done in the Japanese Army Air Force as well. As one pilot who get, gets through this process and flies in the war and does survive, realizes towards the end, you know, a lot of our later pilots that, you know, after the America shot down everybody flying, aren't nearly as good as all those pilots that we flunked out. 
man, we should have had them in the service. We shouldn't have flunked them out. And there, some of the more enlightened ones realize we shouldn't have been beating the hell out of them, too. A lot of them commit suicide at, um, because they know they're failing and don't want to face the shame of going back to whatever it was as a failure. Whatever, you know, either to home or to whatever, uh, you know, regular service duty. They don't want to face the shame of failing. The Japanese I, Army, I don't know if they're so picky on the pilot level, but the Japanese are, Navy is looking to have a very elite fighter, fighter corps. And that's all well and good. And, you know, for your um, carrier pilots who are, because that's sort of what they're looking at, but I've also read um, some accounts of some other zero pilots, uh, well, fighter Navy, naval fighter pilots that weren't focusing on this, but even within the fighter pilots, you had to be really good to get on carrier duty and particularly on the good carriers in the pre-war sense at least um late war it's just anybody that can sort of fly and thinks they can maybe land on a carrier and well let's send them out there oh yeah these these aircraft yeah um they're really hard to land in carriers because you gotta like fly really fast or they like drop out of the sky um, why don't we load them all with cranes and stick them on the carriers and yeah they can take off and go after the enemy and yeah, those that survive can come back and try to land on the carrier, or maybe hopefully they can go land at a nearby friendly um, airbase. I mean, this is literally one of the last major, not the, one of the last missions, but one of the last major missions uh, for our carrier operations against the America. We're loading them up with these new fancy aircraft that were sort of very tricky to fly in, and you had to be, you know, operating at a very at a rather high speed so you can't sort of come in and glide and almost stop on the carrier you have to come in fast and hard and use you know the the tail hook and arrest wings to get them stopped and even then that's a so this is a represent uh, a total disaster waiting to happen and basically sort of is that you get a lot of these under skilled pilots doing this stuff late in the war so early in the war yeah we get the idea and it was a good idea to have on your limited number of carriers because you don't want to crack up airplanes whether it's to lose the airplane, which is a bad thing, or lose the pilot who could be a serviceable pilot and just a few more practices gets good enough at it. And of course you can practice carrier landings on the land with, um, you know, painting a carrier deck, if you will, on a regular um, airstrip and putting, you know, arrestor wires on a, you know, on a land-based airstrip. So if they come down too low, or it's not quite the same because, you know, but they still have a lot of forgiveness on the, you know, non-moving, flat, you know, in good wind conditions, you know, not at sea with bad wind and the decks moving and the ships moving and all this other stuff going on. You can do it with good um, conditions still with a guy out there with the little flags with the, you know, the wave on, wave off and trying to adjust, you know. So you can do it in a relatively safe, both for you and the aircraft land-based um, training to get better for carrier-based training. So you can, you know, with practice, get better. And so, yeah, the elites put those, you know, the best guys out, you know, on on the, you know, the carriers. The rest of the pilots talked about some of the models, um, earlier models that they were late, later, like, um, instead of junking, they were giving to the Manchuko and Air Force and others um, that were not even they didn't even have tail hooks they were some fighter models that predated you know sort of in this time period and a little before um that they were sort of intermediate and, and needing to operate off of islands and such so um to have those guys operational as well would have been um, tremendously good for um japan but they wanted elites they got elites and washed out the rest. So that was not a smart move. Destroyer escort roll advanced. Very good. And we're pushing a little too far ahead. Okay. Um, no here. Okay. Well, we can't quite yet do commerce because we got to get to at least three. But this is too far ahead. But we got what we can do. And that's still 41 technology. So as soon as, well, I don't know, 1940, which isn't that far away or something, we may start doing those to then as soon as, you know, then we can get that because we want 
Uh, not a, maybe not too rushed fast, but fast as we can reasonably do it. Let's do cruiser warfare. So numbers of pilots was a real problem for Japan and its training systems. That was also a real problem for Germany. Um, the only country that wasn't was a real problem was the U.S. They they got a factory systems of training for pilots much more than any other nation. Flying boat prototypes have advanced very good, and we love that. Okay. Um, Hmm. Let's do that. Okay, they are already at war. Okay. We sort of ex I oh and the Germans have pushed in a little bit already. Okay, aero engine research, very good. And which means now we're going to push into that. Well, it's good that they're seeing the possible threat from Burma here and going to it. Germany and forces conquer on Poland. It's still probably because the AI automatically do the... Um, yeah, they did. That's the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact now. Order. Okay, we've got the ability to build more things. Yes, good. Okay, now, um, as you can see, the long lead time for building. And um, between Nick and Jeff and um, Rick, we're all debating from the last episode whether I should build more ICs. I could say easily, yes, I should build more ICs because I do want more ICs. I have a reasonably good, um, oh, we need to try to do um, while we're at this. Let's see if we can buy some American steel. Okay, we get 50 for a total of five. Yeah, that'll, um, we're doing reasonably good on resources. We could build more ICs. Well, one, I'm not used to building ICs of any significant amounts this late in the game. Um, as I think it was Jeff that pointed out, I'm never going to win the war of building ICs once America really gets into the mood of building stuff. Um, this, I don't know currently, you know, if it's still in the, the Great Depression effects, which massively, massively um, limits the um, ICs of America leading up to this. So, um, yeah, that is a big thing. Now I may be able to outbuild them, but once the war go is going and they lose that effect, and I think they'll lose that effect even before the war starts just because people in Europe are now wanting to buy arms and the American Army and Navy wants to buy arms and ships and things so they start gearing up so i'm not going to be able to win that war of you know ic building and also i know that the american ai once it starts running out or running low on manpower it starts switching a lot of its production to ic's with the idea, I believe, of um, sending those ICs as Lend-Lease to its allies, to Britain, to Canada, to South Africa, to Brazil. I, you know, I don't know whoever's joining the allies. I think it should be sending off and also to the Soviets as I see, you know, 
bonuses to lend lease to allow them to use up their manpower and also i believe it will focus on expensive units i believe i because i don't know exactly what the ai is going to do but um but focus on instead of building like manpower intensive but not that expensive infantry divisions they will be building armored divisions with you know armored engineers and mechanized infantry and that things that cost lots of ic's use up some manpower and so build up really good units and build other things that are not too manpower intensive um but really kick butt so I that is also coloring my um, influence is my why I'm taking this and hoping that we're still under that effects because we can still see all the um, uh, oh, what is it I think new order in, in Asia is it that I think is going to go away at some point um, but I think that's the one that will drop that back down um, we're still getting some other effects, but, um, so right now we're not doing too bad for, for situation China. So the question, you know, the amount of ICs I spent on these Kempitai types, keeping the partisans down to get out you know, as much ICs as I can is sort of what I'm doing. I think my plan is instead of building more ICs it is looking at like that, you know, 10 ICs there. Sometimes it can be more than 10 if an event or starting conditions made it more than 10. Yeah, just 10, 10 was a thing. So we've got a lot. Um, so I don't think I'm going to build any, and I do hope to pick up, you know, Indochina's. I don't know if we're going to take Siam or get him as a puppet. I'm not sure. Um, but, you know, we got the Philippines, ICs, and other occupiers, which may not be a lot, but I think that's what we're going to do for that. Now, if we were looking at Germany at doing at something like this I would be more for building ICs because I know I can build a bunch of ICs and then pretty quickly build a bunch of divisions you know to fill out things like all these divisions or whatnot that would sort of help with it but what I'm really thinking I'm going to do is and we've also I want to point out here is research these up to 42 dates these parts these things and these will upgrade um to already built ships these you'd have to send back into the production queue so i've been waiting well let's start with light cruiser no we're going to start with heavy cruisers let's start with four of those no no I'm wrong I'm so used to hitting that one and four light cruisers. So we're going to build eight ships. And here, right now, we're in October. It's going to be August. If they were immediately, which only a few of them would be at the moment, and depending on situations, if I want to. See, we're still at over 90, and we've been going up to 99, so that's why I'm allowing this to be a little under production um but conditions may change of course so you know if and these will obviously will take a while before they start as we clear out well these will build fast or relatively fast but as we clear out some of these other things here um we'll get to these so this is going to be april or august or later for these vessels to come out and I need to build more carriers I need to build more destroyers and other things that take a long lead time so that's what I'm sort of looking at with doing now that has sort of been sort of in the back of my mind and I think I mentioned it is sort of 4041 is naval buildup oh also by the time we're getting around to 41 
we'll probably be getting into some more infantry divisions to do some of this and maybe a few more armor and mechanized type stuff as well okay anti-aircraft ammunition very good um, yeah we'll let that continue and so I'm let's go back here let's look at see them now pushing into France and a little bit into Belgium okay para HQs have advanced very good and yes I know I'm a bit more dogmatic normally on getting these research mostly for the delay between attacks but but delay between attacks are very important still and um, some of those armored HQ bonuses and whatnot special forces bonuses are nice too and so I very well likely do some more of those research but since a lot of my attacks will be sort of isolated type things they're not divisions you know pushing deeper and deeper and deeper into the Soviet Union and the delay between the attacks just slows it up so it becomes critical that I can move faster 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 for an invasion of Soviet Union even if we're looking at Burma and India I just don't see it as being that critical not that it isn't important I think you can tell I still think it's important but it's just not that critical where being up on um, naval techs and things like that are um, more important I'm thinking once we get there and so um, Yeah, let's get carrier aircraft prototypes going. And air techs, too, as well, especially competitive ones. That the American bombers can bomb a little more effectively than my bombers can. Yeah, that's not a good thing, but not a critical thing. But when my air fighters are going up against their fighters, I need the best fighters I can reasonably get, get to do that. So that's what I mean by competitive. Okay, um... Yeah, let's move down to that. Now, does the Soviet Union, now that we've stopped our little war of whatever, want supplies? No, not enough. Does France want supplies? Maybe they aren't as upset with me but maybe they realize they're going to lose and they have more supplies than they could use before they lose. I don't know. No, nope, they're still too upset with me to accept buying supplies. I recently watched a video, a Forgotten Weapons video, good channel on YouTube, um, that France bought, I think, like 500 or something um Thompson submachine guns. I didn't know they did. I know Britain did. They bought a bunch of Thompson submachine guns. Um, that's sort of how they got the name Tommy gun. That and sort of Thompson, but the Tommy gun. Because the Americans were seeing film of uh, the British using them. And the American army hadn't really started using them yet. When um, sort of 1940 and whatnot, that they saw Churchill and others with the Thompson. So it sort of got Tommy again, even though it's an American design, American production. The British Tommy sort of named it. And I think, okay, that Thompson helped. That, that, that is a similar name, helped get that name. Defensive position designs increased. Okay, that is um, here. No, um, here, yeah, we'll stop that. Okay, um, so these guys can sort of wait till 40 because, again, we're not planning on fighting a war, land war, until at least 40, if not later. Um, you could say that about these other things, too, but still. Um, 
Okay, how is our building going on here? Okay, they've completed. They're still building one level of airport. Um, I'm going to throw in another level there. Okay, and we've got, and they're building one more level of radar there. And they're building one more radar, radar level there. That's good. And... Well, we haven't even started building down here because I do want to turn this over to a puppet state sooner rather than later because the couple ICs really isn't worth it. But I want to get things built out here. That's why that's getting the rush job. And I'm hoping the listening post effects here will help me look a little deeper into the Soviet Union. And I'm also hoping that by doing that and once I'm in the Axis the German AI will get a look into it as well. We'll get that information updated even though we're not at war. Just so, I don't know, it helps somehow to see what and how much is out here. Okay. Tack ground crew. Again, I don't know what the AI is going to do with the information even if it sees it. Okay, nav ground crew training will do that. It's 38. But I at least want them to have that option. And But I also want it out as curiosity, too. Oh, wow. Oh, you know something I didn't do? And... We should have done. Turn on historic plans. B-Ice Geo. Yeah, there we go. Now we can see it's the Moselle River. I know that I knew that that was the Muse. I didn't know what that one was. Um, Alexi's mod has been incorporated as that for river names and sea names as well. He's responsible for that. Um, he came up with it. I poked him to do a few more rivers in a few other places, though we don't have much out here in India. But it really helps modders such as myself, and I've doused, I've even touted it to Revolver Held that, well, Black Ice has river names. You should do that in Hearts of Iron 4. And he even did say, yeah, he would like to do that someday um, because we both agreed that what, what a name swear out in Russia are a bit, you know, all these rivers to me are quite, you know, if I don't have a something on the map, you know, I know, I know the Rhine, you know, I know this is the Rhine. Um, I know this is the Meuse. I know this is the Seine, but I don't know what all the other rivers are. Well, I know the Danube, but I know a few of these other rivers, but you know, the Elba and things like that. But, um, you know, so I know some of them, but so many of them, I don't know just looking at them. And so we should have that again. Um, Alexi and most of us are playing as well we got the Yangtze so we should have had that before not a big loss obviously in where we're doing but it does help me to give a little more color to say oh they're across the Moselle as opposed to saying they're across this river so it does help and I do like having that okay uh, we would give them fuel for money okay well we're maxed out on fuel and storage so yes you may have fuel and we are already um, here on these guys. Okay, I think. Mm, let's look technology. Yeah, we're gonna wait to get these armaments up. So. Um, Okay, capital ship, secondary ship. Notice I did move these to the top. That's why they're so far down in here. Before I start building more capital ships. So, let's... Now these are all 41. Well, carriers are technically capital ships, I believe, as well. But, um... Let's 
maybe just a little too much, but two of those would be good. So we are building a big building project because we're also, but we're going to move these guys down to the bottom because they'll build quicker. We want to get these building in production as soon as possible. Because these are, you know, December 11th, 40. So it's, you know, basically over a year. So yeah, you know, if, if they were in full production rate all the time. Um, and possibly adjusted up and or down by practicals from once these guys get built. Probably make it a little shorter build time, but not by a whole lot. Okay, naval bomber prototype. Yes, and that's grayed out, I'm sure. Medium armor designed. Okay. Um, didn't unlock anything else at the moment. But I think we'll leave it there because we are sort of pushing for extra wide tracks to get better infantry tanks um, and you know I think just before let's let's reduce down the officer recruitment program um, uh, yeah, we'll do it to there. Don't want to totally gut the program. Okay, that will allow us to push a bit more into some of these other... Yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, we'll get that. Up charges. Got basically two more slots here, and we will start on our anti-air upper arm development. And I think we're going to end the episode here. I want to thank you all for watching. Thanks for liking the videos. If you would, I really do appreciate that. Hitting that like button. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. And post questions, comments, suggestions, corrections. See you next time for more. You got it. Hearts of Iron.